Here we have a problematic Nintendo plagued with the most predominant issue of the NES ever, the reset of Doom. In this segment, I'm going to show you some repair tips and techniques that'll actually show you how to get your NES uh, back online, back in action, and working like it just came right out of the factory. Before we begin, I'd like to actually explain what is actually causing this reset. If you notice, the LED in the front is resetting once every second. Now, the reason being is primarily because of something called the CIC lockout chip. When Nintendo actually created the NES, they wanted dominant control over who made what games for their console. Reason being is that the actual video game crash in the 80s was primarily due because there were too many shitty games produced by people who didn't know dick about games. So Nintendo knowing this, they wanted to do something about it. Plus they also wanted dominant region control, meaning they do not want Jap games in USA, they don't want USA in Jap, they don't want uh, UK games in Japan and vice versa. So in a way, it's just a um, company just making a stupid mistake, shitting on us in the long run, causing a technical problem with their stupid lockout chips, much to do with practically every single Sony console ever made, and also because of mechanical problems within the actual NES itself. Alright, so this mystical, magical CIC chip, it's actually a microcontroller developed by Nintendo and Nintendo only. Only two companies, to my knowledge, were ever known to make replicas of this chip. Both of them were sued by Nintendo. Uh, what the CIC chip does is it's an actual encryption communication chip, which like, I'll put some links on the show notes of exactly how its function works and even some lawsuits by, uh, by Codemasters and uh, Tengen. But anyway, what the CIC chip does is the microcontroller will communicate within the NES to a game cartridge. So I've actually got Legend of Zelda here, and I'll show you the CIC chip in here as well as inside the NES. So when you put this in, the first thing that happens is the CIC chip comes to life. If it does not communicate with another CIC chip, It'll actually send a reset signal to the actual uh, processor of the NES, telling it to reset once every second. Now, because of this CIC lockout chip, which is the primary uh, primary primary problem, sorry, primary problem of what actually causes this, um, we need to disable that chip. Reason being is because you can actually play import games that do not have a CIC chip. In fact, the earliest models of the NES did not have a CIC chip. It was only on on certain revisions of NES. Now, it is quite popular, but there are games that do not have a CIC chip, very early NES games. Now, the thing is, if you have an early model uh, NES game that does not have a CIC chip, if you actually feel the weight of the cartridge, you'll notice that it's going to be heavier than a later game. Reason being is they actually had to plug the cartridge into an adapter board that did have a CIC chip. Meaning, even if you don't have a CIC chip, you can go and scrap like Gyromite or some of the Balloon Fight, some of the really early games, and get a carrier board that has a CIC chip, completely defeating Nintendo's original idea of why to put a CIC chip inside the console. So, um, the primary reason that the CIC chip fails is because the edge connector with inside the actual NES, because you have to keep pushing the game up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, those pins inside the actual NES cart connector will go out of place over time. And when you can't have communication within, within the CIC chip of the cartridge, it resets over and over and over again. Not to mention a lot of us have actually played Legend of Zelda, uh, the original Legend of Zelda, for a month or more at on end, and there was no saving back then, so you had to keep your NES going at all times. And we come home one day, or we wake up one day and find out that our NES is resetting over and over and we lost all of our work. What happened was, the system overheated, the chip failed, and at any point whatsoever that the communication between the CIC chip within the console and the game break, fail, or do not authenticate in any way, shape, or form, instantly starts to reset over and over again. So, we can disable the actual CIC chip inside the actual NES, so it no longer functions, Keeping it so, the console will never have that one hertz cycle. We'll fix the pins inside here. We'll also look at some other common issues and problems inside the NES. And I'll show you some tips and techniques on how to get this son of a bitch working as if it just rolled right out of the factory. Alrighty, as promised, here's the inside of Legend of Zelda. On the side, you can actually see it's NES, has an SN ROM, and it has the production date, Nintendo. Here's our battery backup for our save games. Uh, this battery can actually fail at some point. You can actually take soldering iron to this and replace it with a standard PC battery. If you want, you can even actually put one in one of those BIOS battery clip holders so you can replace the battery whenever you want. Here's our actual uh, program memory. Here's our character memory. We know that they're programming characters because they're actually printed on the circuit board. Right here it says CH-ROM, which is character ROM, meaning this is our graphics, and PRG is our program ROM. 
And this right here is our actual SRAM. Over here on the chip itself, we actually see MMC, which is Memory Map Controller, which is just a chunk of logic that addresses what goes where inside of a game. If you remember the NES lobotomizing, you should be a little familiar with the actual MMC. If you look on the board, we actually see the, the, the letters CIC. Right here is the CIC chip. Now, this is the CIC chip inside the game. It would be a little bit more effective to actually disable the chip inside the actual NES itself, rather than in every single one of your games, being that you really can't open up all of the games since they use a custom game bit. So anyway, we're going to get to the actual NES side. We're going to start taking it apart. Phillips had screwdriver, basic technique, and we'll get into the NES. All right, for those of you who are not very tech savvy with soldering iron, not absolutely necessary, but you can proceed and solder if you'd like. Basic tools, we're going to need some kind of wire cutters, screwdrivers, a needle nose pliers, and a paper clip. Paper clip will actually have to be folded into a special hook utility. Uh, you know what, let me zoom in and get a closer look at that. As I said, uh, standard paper clip, you can also use a safety pin, some kind of sturdy metal. Using a pair of needle nose pliers, we're going to have to make a small little hook end. We're going to use this to actually put the pins back in place. This was made from an ordinary paper clip. You can also make this, ideally, from a very large safety pin. If you don't have one, paper clips should work just fine. If you are completely whatsoever tech unsavvy, you really don't even need to take your NES apart. Um, I'll actually put it in the, in the show notes on the forums. There's actually online guides. I really can't get a good shot with the actual camera, but with inside the actual NES deck itself, you can actually reach this tool inside to actually fold the top row of pins and the bottom row of pins back into place. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take the actual NES apart so I can show you the technique uh, without actually having to go and rework my camera into the orifice of an NES. Alright, I've taken the top off the NES, nothing more than the simple use of a Phillips head screwdriver. Here's the eject loader, which is the primary problem within the NES. And you can actually see all of the pins down, down here. And uh, using this tool, you can actually just, let me see if I can do it, you can actually sneak underneath and then just lift them up one at a time over and over again. Uh, it's just a very awkward angle for me, so I really can't show you, but I mean, it's, it's a very obvious technique. You just put the, uh, the hook end by the side, underneath, and as you rotate, you can lift it up a bit, so all of those pins actually raise back into position. From here, if your Nintendo just has a constant reset problem, this should fix it, but I'm going to go further in and do a little bit more explanation of some of the other uh, technical issues with the actual NES. All right. Now, I've taken all the screws out, and everything pretty much just comes apart. I've already unplugged all the cable harnesses. If you wanted to get further access into the actual cartridge connector, the deck literally just falls right out of place. Uh, you're going to have a couple of uh, connectors on sides and front. Controller connectors over here. Random asked me to give a pin out because his NES controller ports were damaged, so I'll put that up as a screenshot in a moment. If you wanted to actually go and completely replace this connector, this RF and heat shielding will literally come right off, exposing the bare circuit board underneath the NES motherboard. And this connector, a lot of people will actually go on eBay and sell a brand new you know, NES cartridge connector. Really, they just refurbish it. They go in, they're doing exactly what I'm doing, and they just rip you off by selling more. Uh, this will literally unplug, just trying not to, trying to do it in a way where I'm not going to cut up my hands on circuit tracks. All right, there you go. It's removed. If you really, really need to go in and service this connector, this is the way to do it. It's very simple. Just use of a screwdriver and this handy dandy paper clip tool that we made. We can go in and realign every single one of these pins without any fear of damaging it whatsoever, unless you're a complete freaking idiot. Okay, so we got all of this removed and we're actually down to the motherboard. So. Uh, over here we have the uh, power LED reset button, all that jazz. We've got our two controllers. We have the bottom extent extension port. Uh, we've got some SRAM floating around. We've got, you know, whatever. Zoom into that in a moment. I actually want to focus on this box right here. So let me zoom in and actually show you this box real quick. This big unit right here is actually the RF box as well as the power supply. Uh, you can actually take these, these pins right here and take a multimeter to them and actually figure out which ones are voltage, audio, RF in, RF out. Then the NES actually 
natively spits out a composite signal and going through this actual RF box you'll get some signal noise so if you really want a true composite signal you can tap into these points and get a much cleaner signal. Now if we come over to this, this spot right here this little device right here is actually called a voltage regulator. This is the LM7805 voltage regulator. This means it actually spits out a 5 volt regulated uh, voltage source to the actual console itself. Now, this can actually overheat and die. The NES does, in fact, run off of an AC, or an alternating current voltage source, but being a digital circuit, being a computer, an 8-bit computer at that, it requires digital or a, or a DC voltage. So, in this case, it needs 5 volts. This can easily be replaced. Uh, you can actually go into a lot of common household electronics and pull out an LM7805 voltage regulator. Now, the thing about an LM7805 regulator are all linear regulators for that matter. They require three volts above their output voltage. So this is a five volt regulator. It needs a minimum of eight volts to run. So typically the NES should be run off of nine volts. I do believe it can handle up to either 24 or 34 volts, but ideally nine volts or between nine and 12 will operate the NES with this voltage regulator. Albeit if you operate it from a higher voltage, you do put more strain and this will generate more heat and it will blow out. So if your, if your original power supply has malfunctioned and you've replaced it, this could actually be a key component of why your console doesn't turn on. This would not be very difficult. You just take some desolder braid, uh, desolder, uh, take the solder off of these three little points, take the actual LM7805 out. It'll actually be marked as a 17805 go and get the pinouts online, type in one, uh, 17805 datasheet, and make sure you get something with similar pinouts. If not, make it a gender bender or an adapter. I'll actually go into voltage regulators in another segment, but for the most part, let's get down to the actual board level. All right, so we're actually looking for something called U10. Now, here's U3, here's U1. This is our SRAM for our WRAM. Here's our VRAM. This is U2. And what is this one? Ah, here it is. All right, yeah, U10 right here. Let me try to move some of these parts away and get in a better, cleaner, closer shot. U10, uh, U on, the, on this board indicates that it's a chip. Chip number 10 is going to be your CIC chip. This is the chip that we're going to have to modify if you want to do a CIC lockout mod. Let me zoom in and get a better close-up shot. Okay, this is as close as I can get it. I hope you can read it. Mine actually is labeled as 319A. I'll put in the show notes a document that'll actually list the common CIC lockout chips. If you can notice where I'm pointing right here, it actually says CIC U10. Now, if you notice, there's a little dot right here. Do you see that? I hope so. If you don't, you're fucked. But either way, this dot signifies pin one. So this is going to be pin one. Where are you? Uh, pin one, pin two, pin three, pin four. That pin right there will need to be severed and either attached to ground, which you can use the RF shielding over here as ground, or use a multimeter to find any negative point. Or you can actually just snip it and leave it floating, just bend it away from the board. Now I've actually known people who have gone as far as completely desoldering this chip and putting in a socket so they can remove the chip uh, whenever the hell they need. And they were, it was just a lot more work, but eh, it worked. But either way, I'm gonna go ahead and snip this pin four, and I'm just gonna leave it floating with my pair of wire cutters. And we're gonna go ahead and put the NES back together and check out the uh, before and after of the CIC mod. All right, if you notice, I completely removed pin four now, typically, like I said, you are supposed to actually solder this to ground. If this does happen and you completely destroy the top of the leg like I just did, you'll actually have to take a, a sanding tool or some kind of file, etch into the chip, and then solder onto the leg to repair this. So let's pray to God that this fucking works. All right, I'm going to go and just loosely put the NES back together. I'm not going to put any of the screws in, just in case I screwed up completely on uh, international IPTV. And we'll go ahead and see if this works. Alrighty, I've got the control deck and all the mechanics tightened down. Make sure you can't get the screws nice and tight. If this wobbles around any, it's going to cause any problems. The green line in my screen, ignore this is not coming from the screen or the Nintendo. I have a really crappy power supply, so pretend it's not there. 
Now, before we actually even go into testing the games, uh, Random asked me to uh, give him some ideas on how to fix the controller ports on the NES. Now, uh, his dick brother decided to go and huck the thing across the room, and it damaged both of the ports on the NES. Um, by now, I should have posted some actual screen captures of the actual pinouts and where they go. I'll put some in the show notes as well. However, if your connectors are physically damaged, what you can do is there are two screws underneath the NES, literally right under here. You can take this entire piece out and either buy a replacement or you can get nine pin serial port connectors called DB9 serial connectors. You can cut the back ass end of the, of the connector off of the controller and solder in a nice DB9 connector. I'll put a screenshot up. And you can put the maiden connectors on a piece of plastic and then just kind of rework this. That way you can actually fix your controller ports. Uh, also, the actual LED in the front is just a typical LED. If you want to go do any kind of modding to that, you can easily replace it. 3 volt LED or 3.3 volt, no big deal. Before you even put your actual NES together, you know, the NES is almost as old as I am. It would be a good idea to go ahead and go in a 1 to 10 ratio of bleach to water. Meaning, for every one part bleach, 10 parts water. So one, complete, one cup of bleach, uh, 10 parts water. Uh, go ahead and soak all of the plastic. It'll clean it up really nice. If your parents come in and bitch on what the fuck you're doing in the bathroom to make a mess, tell them, shut your mouth, you're cleaning the tub and in the process, all of your plastic stuff anyway. So that'll actually get the plastic looking like new. This is not applicable to the original uh, SNES that turns piss yellow, completely different reason. Won't, won't work, I've tried. All right, so I've got uh, two games here. I've got Metroid and I've got Super Mario Brothers 3. So when I first started this segment, uh, I actually started the segment out where the, the actual control deck was ejected, meaning the CIC chip could not communicate to the cartridge and it would reset it would reset once every second. So when we turn this on, it should work first try. Works, for, well, besides the green line, works first try. So if I actually eject this, it should actually start to cycle on and off one hertz as the process of the CIC chip. And if you notice the LED, is it blinking on and off? Which means the CIC chip is completely disabled. Now we'll try Metro. First time, every time. If you actually want to go the extra mile, what you can actually do is take an alcohol swab and clean out all of the contacts and whatnot, but be really careful not to use anything that's corrosive because this is copper. You do not want to cause any kind of tarnishing or anything like that. So, um, I guess that pretty much covers everything. I hope it answered everyone's questions on how to actually revive your NES and get it restored to practically factory new. All of my consoles, uh, consoles have been cleaned, all of my, my my carts have been cleaned, CIC chips have been disabled, uh, regulators have been replaced if necessary, all of my decks and my cartridges work first time, every time. And that CIC chip, CIC chip completely disabled. That's really weird how it's actually playing that. That's creepy. Anyway. <laughs> hope everyone enjoyed the segment. I hope I uh, actually answered all of your questions. If anything, as always, on the forums, hit the show notes. I'm on IRC. I'll be more than willing to help you guys out trying to get your NES back to life.